In this community, we wear our hearts on our sleeves. We don't have filters or walls. And it's not because we are proud or confident in ourselves, but we believe in a gracious God, a God who invites us to bring our full selves together in this community. So I invite you this morning to worship with us today in this space or in some other space online. And trust that your hurt and joy, that your prayers and dreams are all welcome here in this community. We gather to worship with the conviction that God welcomes all of us as sons and daughters. We are family together. And so we come together to worship because we trust that God is listening. Let us therefore worship God together.
And all God's people said, Amen. So be it. Let us unite our hearts in prayers, friend. O God of mercy, O God of grace, we have friends and family who are living with grief and chronic illness. We have neighbors who are alone and ignored. And we see too many families in our community who are suffering with the trauma of poverty. So much of the suffering that we see and we hear in the voices of those crying out in pain, we know that we do not have the power to change their circumstances. We have no words that might take their pain away, but what we do have within ourselves and together is the ability to listen to those who are hurting. As we listen, we will be reminded of the hurt that we each carry ourselves and the memories and regrets of how we have stumbled in the past. And as we listen, we will be reminded that our neighbors, our siblings in faith, also come to this space and this community carrying heavy burdens. O oh Lord, dust off our ears and stretch open our hearts that we might lean into one another as we lean into you. On this day, draw us closer, Lord, for we are listening and we are prepared to pray. Pray the prayer that your son taught us so long ago, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand as you're able for our first song. In my resting and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence, you won't let go. In my questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. Tomorrow brings with each morning I rise and sing. My God's love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness. I will follow you, oh, my lighthouse, my lighthouse. Well, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore. Brightest. 
the promise you will carry me safe to shore safe to shore safe to shore safe to shore you may be seated We all know that almost anywhere that you look in our world, you will find people who are in pain and people who are suffering. Rolling blackouts in Texas, fires in California, and rising cases of people who are hospitalized again with COVID all across the country. And yet we gather week by week as a community of faith. And when we gather, we commit ourselves to the mission and ministries to serve our community, to serve our neighbors. It is through our shared gifts together that we offer care and concern to those who are hurting in our community. We are the neighbors who lean in and ask the hard questions. Where does it hurt? How can we help? You see, we are a community that chooses connection and generosity rather than despair and fatigue. And all of our collective acts of care, connection, and love together, I believe they send a compelling message to all those who are hurting. The message is that God has not given up on this world, and neither have we. For we have received the grace of God, and we all have seen the healing power of love revealed through Jesus Christ. And so, today we commit again that we will not give up either. I invite you to join us to do all that we can together to make God's love and care relevant to those who are hurting and to those who are feeling hopeless and alone. Let us pray. Lord, today we sent off our middle school youth on their encounter mission trip. Be with them as they go to experience your wonder in New Mexico. This is just one of many programs that would not be possible without the tithes and offer offerings we bring to you, forward to you today. Help to multiply them for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Seems like all I could see was the struggle Haunted by ghosts that lived in my past Bound up in the shackles of all of my faith Wondering how long is this gonna last? Well, then you look at this prisoner and say to me, son, stop fighting a fight that's already been won. I am redeemed, you set me free, so I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain, I'm not who I used to be, I am redeemed. All my life I have been called unworthy Named by the voice of my shame and recall 
grand But when I hear you whisper Child, lift up your head I remember, oh God You're not done with me yeah. I am redeemed You set me So I'll shake off these heavy chains, wipe away every stain. I'm not who I used to be, because I don't have to be the old man inside of me. His day is long dead and gone, because I've got a new name, a new life. I'm not the same and I hope that will carry me home for I am redeemed you set me free so I'll shake off these heavy chains wipe away every stain I'm not who I used to be. No, I'm not who I used to be. Jesus, I'm not who I used to be. I am Thank God we did. Scripture lesson this morning comes from the book of 1 Samuel in the Hebrew Bible. We'll be reading from the first chapter, verses 1 through 18. Here now our scripture. There was a certain man of Ramathayim, a Zophite from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other was Peninnah. Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh, where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife Peninnah and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her rival used to provoke her severely, to irritate her because the Lord had closed her womb. And so it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore, Hannah uh, wept and would not eat. Her husband said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they'd eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat behind the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and she prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow. O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazarite until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli thought she was drunk. Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. 
I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I've been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. Then Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. Here ends our reading. Let us bow now together in prayer. God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, be acceptable in thy sight. Pray this in Christ's name. Amen. She came into my office upset. She was angry the minute she walked through the door. She was angry about a situation. She was angry about other people. She was angry about their responses and their lack of response. She went on for a while, angry. After a while, I obviously sensed something wrong. There was probably something wrong in her, and I just said simply to her, Are you okay? She kind of stopped and looked at me and said, Well, and then tears began to fill her eyes broke down, and she talked to me about the pain she was experiencing. Pain in her marriage, pain with her children, pain in her life. It changed her countenance. She wasn't angry. She was sad. Oftentimes when we deal with other people and you feel the anger, you feel the sharp, biting presence, it's they're acting out of pain. Not necessarily anger. You've seen it. It happens all over in our world today. People are hurting and oftentimes reacting out of anger. Great writer Brene Brown has said, Every single one of us has something that has hurt us. She writes, Without self-awareness and the ability to manage our emotions, we often unknowingly lead from hurt, not heart. Not only is this a huge energy suck for us and the people around us, it creates distrust, disengagement, and an eggshell culture. It's easier to share our anger than to make ourselves vulnerable by sharing our pain. So oftentimes we react like that. It's hard in a world where we can't share our pain, and social media doesn't help us at all. We post pictures of beautiful graduations, birthday celebrations, weddings, but not of getting out of rehab. We share photos of a great vacation we just took to the Caribbean, but not the fight that we had in the airport or the bills that we're going to have difficulty paying after it. We share photos of our wedding anniversaries, but not of those days when one partner or the other talks themselves into staying in the marriage and trying to work it out. I've been meaning to ask, where does it hurt? That's one thing we're doing this, uh, in the coming weeks. That's our series, I've Been Meaning to Ask. Questions that we can ask one another. Because questions are so important. Why? Because questions mean that we have an open mind. Richard Rohr, a great theologian, has said, Ignorance is not a result of what we don't know, but what we think we know. You see, when we're certain we know, we don't have a capacity to learn. Why learn? We already know. But when Jesus faced this certainty in the scribes and Pharisees around him, that were more than willing to tell people how to act, when to act, and what to do, and they knew what was right, he took and put a child in front of them. And when, she put, when he put her in front of them, he said, unless you become like this child, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Unless you open your mind, unless you're willing to learn, unless you're curious, well, you're not going to experience the kingdom of heaven. Where does it hurt? When we're around other people, it's important for us to be curious about them. To want to hear about them, even if they're angry, especially if they're angry. Because words like, where does it hurt, can bridge gaps. Last week, 
you heard John talk about where are you from. When we hear someone's story, when we hear their past, it can change our view of them. Likewise, where does it hurt? When you hear someone's grief, what they're dealing with, and we all have that, it changes the way we see it. Where does it hurt? You know, our scripture today is a perfect example of that question. Where does it hurt? It's the story of Hannah found in 1 Samuel. You just heard that. And on the surface, it seems like a pretty simple, straightforward story, doesn't it? Hannah's childless. She prays to God for a child. Then she gets a child. Happy ending. All goes on. But don't, don't forget to ask questions, especially of the text. Because it reveals a lot about what's going on here. There's a lot of grief in this story. And we need to get at the bottom of it. The story is Elkanah. Elkanah is a man. He has two wives that they had at the time. One is Hannah. She did not have children. But the other one is Penina. And Penina, it says, had sons and daughters. Multiple children. And every year, the whole family would go as a family to the temple to worship God, to sacrifice. Elkanah, as the head of household, would sacrifice uh, for his family, to God. And so to Penina, he would offer a sacrifice to her, to all her children. But to Hannah, did you hear? He offered a double portion because he loved her. He felt for her. He could even feel her pain. And afterwards, every year, they would go to dinner. And on one side of the table, Panina would be there with her kids, and she'd be distracted, she'd be holding them, the kids would be throwing food, there'd be a flurry of activity, and she could see Elkanah smile at the kids, love what they did. And on the other side of the table was Hannah, alone, quiet, by herself, Panina couldn't help it. She'd seen the double portion that Elkanah had given to the one, one he loved. And so she'd throw in some words. Too bad you can't have kids like this. Boy, it must be quiet over there when you don't have kids. She grieved her. She provoked her, the scripture says, provoked her severely, irritated her year after year. Finally, Hannah couldn't take it anymore, and she wept bitterly. She refused to eat. Elkanah came to her and said, Why do you weep? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? He asked questions. When the excruciating dinner was over for Hannah, she went to the temple. She went to pray. Maybe she didn't know where else to go. Maybe that's what prayer is. Hannah did not censor herself or pray in graceful language. She spoke harshly about her pain. She wept bitterly, Scripture tells us. She cried for all the years that her arms had been empty. She cried about Elkanah's decision to take a second wife. And that look of pride in his eyes every time Penina had a baby. She cried about her fear of the future. She cried about that ugly word, barren. She was sad. She was lonely. She was desperate. And she did what desperate people often do. She made a vow to God. But her vow did not involve anything killing-wise. She promised that if God would give her a son, she would give that child back to God. Now, Hannah didn't pray the way people usually do in the temple. She didn't go in and ask the priest to intercede for her and to pray for her in this way. She poured out her own heart to God. Her lips were moving, but she was praying silently. Eli was the priest on duty, and he noticed this, and he watched her, and he saw her praying silently, but thinking that if he couldn't hear her voice, she wasn't really praying, he rudely accuses her of being drunk. Hannah might have fled in shame at this criticism, but she stood up to him. No, I'm pouring my heart out to my God. She was not the worthless woman that Eli had assumed. Hannah found her voice, not only before God, but before this insensitive priest. To his credit, Eli backed off, but he didn't apologize. He blessed her and asked that God grant her 
petition. Something happened right there to Hannah. Perhaps she felt like she had been heard. Perhaps the crying had been a cleansing and a release for her. Perhaps she let go a little of the dream she'd pursued for so long. She went on her way. She ate and drank with her husband, and she was not so sad anymore. They went back to their home, and Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel. What a wonderful story. But don't miss the grief. Where does it hurt? You know, on the surface, Elkanah looks like a perfect husband. He asked questions. Did you hear his questions? Why does it hurt? Why are you weeping? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? But he does not give her time to answer. Did you hear her answer? There was none. He asked the questions, but he did not listen. Part of our questioning involves listening. If we're interested enough to ask the questions, we need to be interested enough to listen. You know, I can sympathize with Elkanah because it's hard to hear a loved one suffering and in pain. You want to take care of the situation. You want to solve it. You want to make them feel better. But sometimes there is nothing you can do. It's difficult to be there. But it's also important to hear their pain. I wonder how it would have been instead of saying, am I not worth more than 10 sons to you? Saying, you are worth more than 10 sons to me. To build someone up in pain. Likewise, Eli the priest, he was even less skilled at listening. He intervened in a situation he didn't understand. And he made some erroneous assumptions. If he'd simply asked Hannah about her situation, he would have done so much more. Where does it hurt? But instead he made assumptions. Isn't that easy to do? When someone's upset, when someone's angry, we assume we know what's going on, but many times we don't. That's why we question. Where does it hurt? People who are in pain and grief need the opportunity to, to talk without being judged or advised or prematurely consoled. They don't need words as much as they need patient, careful listening. Hannah found that God was a good listener. In the first chapter, she was a silenced, diminished woman. But her prayer helped her to find voice, which rang out in an articulate, powerful song. What about Panina? Panina, the rival, the second wife, the one with children, provoking her, irritating her year after year, rubbing it in her face. Her anger, her frustration came from her pain. She saw the love that Elkanah had for Hannah, and it killed her. She would lack that too. But no one reached out to her. No one asked her, where does it hurt? And that pain, that grief continued. Wow. You know, what about the other pain in this story? The story goes on after the part we had read, when Samuel was weaned at five years of age. She brings Samuel to the temple, and she dedicates him to God, and then she leaves. She leaves Samuel at the temple only to see him every year. She would drop off items to him and see him. How painful would that be to leave a child at the temple and see him once a year? Heck, it's hard enough for us parents to drop off an 18-year-old at college that we're probably going to see too often coming home. But to drop a 5-year-old off, even in joy, the pain continues. Hannah went on to have other sons and daughters and could celebrate those children. But the absence of Samuel, no matter how powerful Samuel's witness was in the history of faith, it's difficult for a mom to do that. So the question is there. Where does it hurt? What about you? How are you as a comforter? Are you able to ask 
difficult questions? Are you able to ask, where is your pain? Where does it hurt? Are you curious about others? I talked to a mom a couple weeks ago. The child was having some problems, so they went to a counselor. They were at the counseling, and the kid was sharing his pain, sharing his journey. And mom kept saying, I don't understand. Say more about that. Please, I don't understand. Finally, the counselor looked at her and said to her, yours is not to understand. Yours is to listen, to hear, to be present, and to love unconditionally. Where does it hurt? Sometimes we can't solve the problem. Sometimes we don't understand. But our presence, wow, it's good news. We are there to ask questions, to hear stories, to listen, to allow people to be complex, to discover our connection with them. Listen, there's good news in this story for you. If you are grieving, you are not alone. All of us carry that with us. And if you feel alone, take an example from Hannah. You can make yourself vulnerable to others, but you can go to God honestly, openly, sharing pain and grief, even weeping bitterly. And God hears. The good news for us is the pain is not ours and ours alone. Where does it hurt? Let's bow together in prayer. Oh God, give us strength in desperate situations. Make us curious. Open our hearts to new learning. And open our hearts to sharing even our pain with others. That we might be a community of faith, lifting one another up. Not in judgment, but in unconditional love. For it's in Christ's redeeming name that we pray. Amen. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. The wonders of your mighty love My comfort, my shelter Tower of refuge and strength Let every breath, all that I am Never cease to work Yeah.
to tower of refuge and strength. Let every breath, all that I am, never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us see. sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. There are a lot of tables in our world, lunch tables, where we leave the anxiety of work aside for an hour to talk and meet a friend. Conference tables, where we gather and leave behind the ordinary and the routine and dream about something new, something yet unseen. Family dinner tables, where we share our love and laughter and savor the days that we have together. This morning at 6 a.m., 21 middle school youth and all of their sponsors departed for New Mexico. And they went there to experience an outdoor and spiritual retreat we call Encounter in this faith community. At this campsite, I'm not sure they'll have any physical tables, but I do know that they will be invited to this table and the meal that we host on behalf of our risen Savior. There is something profoundly different about this table compared to all of our other tables. This is a table that addresses the deepest hungers of our hearts, and it is where we meet both friends and enemies. This is the table where we get a glimpse of God's dream for the world. And because this, uh, uh, this table that God has prepared, where everyone has a chair and their name already on it, the place where no one is forgotten, no one left out, because Jesus Christ has saved a seat for everyone who is able and willing to come. So come and know the joy of this table and the satisfaction of this meal. We remember that on the night he was betrayed, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to all who were present and said, Take and eat, friends. This is my body which is broken, but now, friends, for you it is given. It will become for you the bread of life. And then after the supper was finished, he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said, Friends, this is the cup of the new covenant. Truly I tell you, it is my own blood which is poured out. It is poured out so that all might be forgiven, all might be reconciled, that you might even be able to forgive yourself. As often as you gather in my name, friends, eat this bread and drink from this life-giving cup, until I come again in glory. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we pray that you would still our minds and quiet our hearts as we approach this communion table today. We ask that you would draw each one of us into ever closer fellowship with yourself as we partake together of the bread and wine in grateful remembrance of what you did for each one of us on Calvary's cross. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, dried and true. 
Now, as our acolyte changes our light, reminds us that the light does not go out, it is merely changed. Sometimes the light is difficult to get lit, but with persistence and with caring, we can get that light lit. And sometimes people in our lives grieving need the persistence around them as well. Let us stand now for the benediction. I'd invite you immediately following in our fellowship hall for our common ground. We'll meet together at tables, and we'll be able to share our stories with one another during Common Ground. also invite you as you leave in the uh, rotunda area on the table out there, there are some bracelets with the name of each one of the participants in our mission trip, our encounter trip that the kids are taking. I'd like you to take one of those bracelets, put it on, and pray for those people throughout the coming week. Uh, they may need to pray for you. Well, we're suffering from a 100-degree temperature. They're walking in the cool mountains, but uh, it's a wonderful encounter with God. So let's pray for those kids. Let's bow together in prayer. Oh God, send us forth as your people, a people committed to sharing our grief and our pain and to asking, where does it hurt? We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, shining in the darkness, I will follow you, oh. My lighthouse, my lighthouse, I will trust the promise. You will carry me safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore, safe to shore. Thank you for worshiping with us. Go peace.